Welcome to a special edition of Post Media's Ottawa Senators panel. And this, uh, this week's uh, version, we're going to look at the decade that was uh, in Senators' history. Not a, not a particularly great decade, uh, especially from the decade that preceded it. I'm Ken Warren with Bruce Garriock and special guest Steve Warren of the Steve Warren Project podcast. Thanks once again for coming in and helping us dissect the decade that was. I mean, where do you start? Maybe, maybe we start with the number of the turnover in the front office and coaching staff. Six coaches in the uh, in the decade. Yeah, it was uh, a tumultuous decade when you look at it. Particularly, like you said, when you compare it to the one that preceded it, it just seemed like they were a perennial playoff team. They were always kind of hanging around as one of the better teams in the league, and and obviously things changed from there. And when you go sideways on the ice, the coaching staff is going to see some uh, some turnover, and they never quite got it right. I mean, six is a lot in one decade. And I think that was a case of the organization truly, in most cases, going for guys who don't cost a lot of money, who don't have a lot of experience. And sometimes with that comes um, the inexperience can sometimes lead to an ineffective hockey team. But it wasn't like they didn't have some success under some of those coaches. You know, a trip to the Eastern Conference Final against the Pittsburgh Penguins under Guy Boucher, the Hamburglar run uh, in uh, 2015. That's right, That's yeah. right with, with Dave Cameron, uh, that magical run. There were some highlight moments in there. There were obviously some difficult moments for this franchise during the last 10 years. But I think that there were, I think when I look back certainly on that, on that 2017 playoff series with, with Guy Boucher and Clark MacArthur's overtime goal after coming back from uh, concussion issues uh, to beat the Boston Bruins in round one. There were some great moments uh, during those 10 years as well. That was a fun run, for sure. Yes. That was a fun run. They won two series in that and, and surprised a lot of people. Let's face it, they went into the playoffs as a low seed and, and, and kind of I, I think turned a lot of heads and 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 also you talk about the highlights there were two brilliant goals in that series uh author, authored by carlson one was to uh to to derek broussard remember trailing early in that series and he drew the defense and threw it across that that was a fantastic goal the other fantastic goal against boston was the pass the, the looping pass to hoffman yeah, now yeah. I think, that's the great, to, I think that's the greatest goal in Sens history, by the way. It was really, an right? unbelievable goal. And, and I think those are the things, yes, we're going to talk about highlights, the hamburger run and people throwing hamburgers on the ice and Curtis Lazar to talk about guys that, you know, faded, but uh, picking up the hamburger off the ice. Those are, those are some, pretty, some pretty signature moments, I think, in Senators history. But then you, then you look and you look at everything else that happened in a couple of uh, uh, different stops and starts of how they want to rebuild this thing, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been stops and starts. There's been missteps. There's been um, a lack of spending. I feel like this conversation is starting to morph into me talking about the negatives and Bruce getting all the positives down there, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there's, everybody knows that there has not been a very good decade. And, uh, and the rebuild we're seeing now is, is kind of, I think, a reboot. You know, we've yeah. all had problems with our computers at our desk, and we just sort of throw our hands up and we just go reboot. And that's how it feels like the Sens are right now. Let's get things back to square one. Let's, let's really step back and let's do this thing right, get a foundation down, and then we can move forward. And two, three years from now, this team will be very, very good. Well, for, for a while there, it was like uh, the team is, is Alfredson. Maybe for better or worse, Alfredson was the central, you know, Daniel Alfredson was a central figure and ever, and then he, he, he left on sort of un, unsatisfactory terms twice, right? And, and once as a player and once in management. And maybe that, for a lot of people, is sort of saying, wow, this, this slide happened when that happened. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. But Alfredson was such a figurehead on this team. Well, and I think his departure in, in, uh, for the Detroit Red Wings caught everybody off guard. I think that, you know, once the Senators at that time allowed him to start speaking with other teams, we, you know, we talked very seriously with the Boston Bruins and they thought they had him. And the Detroit Red Wings at the time, he went to unrestricted free agency and moved on. Uh, I think that, you know, people at our time, because they don't know what happened here or they don't feel like they know what happened here. But I... I I look at the situation now with, with the rebuild and where this organization is going to go. They've got a lot of hard work ahead of them. Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit about stuff that went wrong. And, and, and then we, you know, the, the whole Carlson Hoffman situation uh, in terms of oddities that happened during 
during the, the decade, uh, you know, it was it was sort of a weird departure. Neither one of them came back, right, after that because uh, Hoffman got traded and to San Jose that flipped him to Florida, and Carlson, of course, then made it to training camp before the, the trade. But it's just an odd, odd story that, that you don't see every day in the sports world. No, I mean, it's, uh, and it's a sign of the times, right? Social media can be a pretty ugly place. And we all know the story of uh, the dialogue that allegedly occurred on, on social media. It was some pretty ugly stuff. But, uh, you know, with, with those two players, it was, um, you know, with the Hoffman deal, you look at it and you say, man, that is a good player. And they didn't seem to get enough for him. But it really spoke to the fact that uh, from a team building standpoint, they had to make a move and they had to make it quickly. And their hands were tied to some degree with, with that circling around the player. You weren't going to get top dollar for him as far as assets coming back. And uh, the Carlson thing, on the other hand, well, I think that was a case of, it really, to me anyway, looks like the new policy this organization has. Take care of the guys out of their entry-level contract, give them their second contract, but when it comes time to that UFA time, I think that uh, they're not into giving those six- to eight-year contracts to those types of players. Well, and I, I think if you look certainly at the Hoffman and Carlson situation, I think you have to look at that at face value. and there, The teams were dropping like flies. When that story about Hoffman came out, Hoffman and Carlson came out, the teams went running for the exits. And really, there weren't a lot of options left when, when uh, Pierre Dorian made that trade. Uh, some teams that expressed interest said they were no longer interested. As far as the Carlson deal, both, both, both sides had decided that they were going in right. a different direction. Uh, there seems to be a narrative here, but, but I think that, that Eric Carlson had decided he wasn't going to stay uh, you know, they did offer him. I think they offered him $88 million on July 1. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had decided he wasn't going to stay. And they had decided they were going in a different direction with a rebuild and decided to get some assets for it. It looks like that down the road, that deal is going to work out very well for them. It, it might be. And, and, and we'll revisit this in three or four years and see, and see where San Jose is because there's a team that's gone all in right they've thrown all the chips in we better win now or we're done and where carlson's going to be in six or seven years that contract uh there's even now you're sort of saying injury prone uh inconsistent that might be an issue for san jose well will be an issue for san jose down the road whereas in ottawa you got you know rudos balsers in that trade you got josh norris in the minors you got another draft pick coming uh it, it could look really good well, I think you've got a situation where you've got a frugal ownership. I don't think there's any question about that. And this is, again, they don't like giving out that third contract. I think they're absolutely petrified about another Bobby Ryan type of a deal. And, and you know what? There's, there's wisdom in that because for every guy in their third contract, the UFA who gets an eight-year contract and it works out great. There's Can I just least stop you for one second? Yeah. Jason Spatz has to be traded on a long-term deal. Danny Heatley has to be traded on a long-term deal. As you said earlier, the Bobby Ryan deal hasn't worked out. I'm not. Sure. I think that's part of the reason ownership doesn't want to go that route. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, again, absolutely. I, I, again, no, no, they've been burned. The, they've been burned. Yeah. To finish the thought, I, absolutely. And and it's not. It's not like just from a fan's perspective. I think if for every every player that gets that eight year contract when they're 27 years old. I mean, there's, a, there's at least one or two more that don't work out and they're disasters. I mean, is anybody in Montreal really happy about the Carey Price deal right now? I don't think so. Yeah, good no. point. No. And, 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 you know, and, and to your point about eight-year deals, Kenny, is that now those eight-year deals go to guys like Shabbat and Kachuk and, right. and a long-term yeah. deal no, and a long-term deal for, for yeah. those, those, those deals used to go when you were 27 years old. Yeah. Now this organization sees that they, that they want to give these to, to their younger players, and that's the way that they want to build. Uh, when the Kachuk one comes in, I'll be all in. I'll say absolutely fantastic. So that's going to be the next tough one for them to do. Um, we just talked about ownership and strategies. Uh, we can't dismiss this decade without talking about Le Breton Flats and the inactivity there, a lot of it involving the owner and not being able to get along with his partners and, and whether this project ever gets done. I mean, that in, in the minds of the citizens of the city, it, it, it's just one of those things that's just hanging in the air waiting for something to happen. Well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously going to be a better situation to be downtown. Every pro team would like to be downtown, ideally. Um, it, it's going to help your attendance. It's going to help everything. Um, but that said, they're in Canada now, and they've been there since day, well, since 96, and it's still been a pretty good game day experience, I think, for the average fan. 
Uh, would you like to get downtown? Absolutely. But, uh, and, and it looks like they've still, the NCC has left room for them yeah. for the future uh, to uh, maybe still build there if they can get their act together. If we can see everything get less litigious between <laughs> ownership and whoever he'll be dealing with, that would be great. But uh, um, it, it remains to be seen whether it'll work out or not. Well, and I think what they have to do, Kenny, for the next five years is, is the, you know, close that chapter on LeBreton and focus on being in Canada and, and getting the crowds back there and focus on this rebuild, putting the right pieces in place to make this, to get this team back to respectability and building a winner out there and getting the fan base back out there. I still think LeBreton's the answer, but hey, that's the, for us to disagree on this panel. Thanks very much for tuning in for the Decade in Review. Steve Warren, Bruce Garriott, and myself, Ken Warren. Thank you.